Welcome everybody to the folks who have joined us already. Thank you for being on time. I'm going to wait just a few moments here for some other folks to make it. I know we had a, a heavily subscribed webinar this go around, lots of registrants. So wait until we reach something of a critical mass and then we'll, we'll kick things off out of respect for everybody's time. Yeah, I see some folks still trickling in here, which is great. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Just another moment or two. And we'll get started. Okay, well. We are at the top of the hour. Let me go ahead and welcome everybody to today's presentation titled Halal Investing 101. Today, we're going to discuss the following broad topics, and hopefully folks are going to walk away with some action items as well. But those three topics are the fundamentals of halal investing. Next up, screening criteria for Sharia compliant or halal investments. And then we'll conclude with common challenges and misconceptions in halal investing, sort of the fact versus fiction side of things today. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just beginning your financial journey, our goal today is to equip you with the knowledge and tools to make informed investment decisions that align with your values. Thanks for attending today. We're really pleased to have you here. And we'll go ahead and get the disclaimers out of the way. As well, this discussion is for educational purposes only. The webinar is being recorded, and we also highly recommend that you speak with your financial advisor for information that's specific to your financial situation. Today's speakers are on your screen now. I'm Josh Brockwell, Investment Communications Director here at Azad. I'm responsible for all things marketing and also spearhead our shareholder advocacy program. Also, we're really pleased to have with us today our president and CEO, Bashar Qasim. He's joining us today to answer your questions. I will mention that Bashar is one of the first in the United States to hold the CSAA designation. That's the Certified Sharia Auditor and Advisor credential. That is exceedingly rare in the United States, number one. And it's especially unique because uh, Bashar is both an investment advisor with 30 years of practical knowledge working in the financial service industry and someone who holds that accreditation. So it's a nice, it's a nice thing at Azad to have someone with that um, combination of both the academic and the, and the practical. So thank you for being here today, Bashar. Cool. First up, a brief word about Azad Asset Management. For more than a quarter of a century, Azad has been helping high income professionals build their wealth in accordance with Islamic values. Today, we manage uh, over one and a half billion dollars for families all across the United States. What makes us odd, unlike many other financial firms, is the quality and nature of our advice, I uh, believe, and it's centered around you and your family, driven by a higher purpose, which we'll talk about today, and designed to help give you peace of mind knowing your financial life is on track. couple recognitions. We don't do it for the awards, but it's nice to have the, val the validation out there. Azad Asset Management is very pleased to have been named to the CNBC Financial Advisor 100 list, list of top advisors in the United States. Uh, several of our investment strategies have been named to Informa Financial Intelligence's PSN Top Guns Awards. Um, it's a quarterly ranking that takes place. Uh, we're regularly listed in that database. And most recently, our Halal Fixed Income, the Azad Wise Capital Fund, received a Lipper Fund Award for 2024. In fact, two Lipper Fund Awards, one for Best Fund over three years in the international income category, and another for Best Fund over five years, also in the international income category. Please take a look at our website for more information about the methodology for those awards and recognitions. Now, let's take a minute to explain why we're talking about this. This is a big deal. And those of you on this call today, I think, understand that it's a big deal. Halal investing is a foundational part of Islamic finance more broadly, which emphasizes ethical, fair, and just financial principles. What does this mean? One of the biggest reasons Islamic finance matters 
is because it's based on principles derived from our sacred sources of law or legislation, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, which both emphasize ethical, fair, and just financial practices. So this includes prohibiting interest or riba, also excessive uncertainty or gharar, and investments in harmful or unethical industries. Unlike conventional finance, which often transfers risk to borrowers, Islamic finance emphasizes risk sharing between uh, two individuals or multiple parties. This can lead to more equitable financial transactions and that prohibition of speculative activities and excessive leveraging in Islamic finance can contribute to greater financial stability more broadly in an economy. The focus on asset-backed financing and real economic activity helps prevent the creation of financial bubbles. And of course, Islamic finance gives Muslims, practicing Muslims, a way to invest that aligns with their values. Bashar, anything to add on that? Um, I just want to say, like, you know, the whole thing, the the whole uh, uh, frame of uh, or the concept of behind the uh, the Islamic uh, in, in investment and Islamic finance, it's uh, from the Quran where Allah mandated that we should not deal with each other unjustly and uh, everything has to be within uh, consent of the two parties uh, with satisfaction. And then uh, the Sharia defined what is uh, considered to be uh, uh, unjust, which is the riba and the uh, the gambling, the 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 unknown or the speculation uh, in the transactions uh, and the intoxicants. And from that, the scholars they uh, elaborate. Uh, through, of course, the uh, the Sunnah, to define the principles upon which you can uh, deal with, we can deal with each other when it comes to commerce and businesses. Uh, riba, I just want to say something like about the riba that uh, riba, it's uh, uh, as you define it, uh, it it is really uh, a concept that is, I would call it, deceptively simple. Uh, or challengingly easy, which means uh, it, it is too easy that it doesn't cross your mind. Um, and th th of course, there is the best way to understand riba. It's what you just uh, defined here in the in the slide. If you can go ahead, Josh. Yeah. So you, you mentioned riba. It's obviously an important part of Islamic finance and halal investing specifically. It's, the, it's really a big topic in the industry. It's traditionally defined as usury or more accurately, really any type of interest. And it's seen as a way for lenders to earn money without any effort or risk or minimal effort or risk, leading to unjust enrichment at the expense of borrowers who bear all the risk. It's kind of the rationale behind its prohibition in Islamic finance. It can lead to the exploitation of borrowers, particularly those in vulnerable financial positions as they may end up paying really high rates of interest and falling into a, a debt trap. Correct. So as you mentioned, Bashar, riba is explicitly prohibited in the Quran and Sunnah, our, our sources of jurisprudence in Islam. For Muslims engaging in or benefiting from riba is considered a serious violation of uh, Islamic legislation and moral principles. This includes in our investments, which a lot of people uh, really don't think about. And we have some justifications for the prohibition, the prohibition of riba in the Quran, as well as the Sunnah. And it's a large body of work um, that our scholars have have um, developed, really, to help us avoid it in our, our daily transactions and in, uh, specifically our finances. And as it relates to investing, there are several boxes. Uh, according to our scholars, that we need to you know, check off to make sure we're not falling into riba. Um, you see some of them on your screen there. Really, we should understand the rules of riba-free investing. We need to know what we're investing in in order to determine whether or not there is riba in that uh, transaction or in that investment. If you don't know, you should ask. And uh, also, ideally, eliminate the haram from your portfolios. From your portfolios. But sure, I don't know if you want to... Um, Talk about the the, the rules of muamalat versus other elements of uh, of the deen. I know it's your sure. specialty. Sure, you know, like in in general, just uh, uh, in in general, the halal, as the scholars define it, is the um, what is its unknown 
what is its origin is unknown. That by default things are halal. And you can find this in the uh, in different sections of the fiqh, including the food and the drinks and uh, even some form of ibadat. Uh, but when it comes to the mu'amalat, because of the serious prohibition of riba, the rule change and becomes al-jahlu bil-riba kal-ilmi bih. Like and, uh, ignoring or ignorance of riba is as sinful as... Uh, being aware of it. What does, what does that mean? That means like any uh, transactions, you need really to examine it to make sure that it doesn't really have the riba specifically. Uh, before, you, uh, 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 before you conduct such a transaction. And that's why um, uh, among uh, the Sahaba, specifically uh, uh, Khalifa Omar ibn Khattab, had had uh, had a famous saying that do not approach our market those who do not have the basics of uh, fiqh of the uh, dealings and the transactions fiqh means understanding otherwise they will run into riba over and over so you and and as i mentioned riba is challengingly easy but um, the best thing to understand because there are really different forms of riba there is riba that is stated clearly in the Quran. We call it riba nasi'a, which is really the deferment of debt with an increase, where the debt grow just by the mere passage of time. And this is called the riba, the riba of the Quranic riba, because it's really mentioned in the Quran. And that's really when the uh, that has the serious prohibition. The Prophet, peace be upon him, wants to protect us from to fall into this, the Quranic riba. So he explained to us in the sunnah means that could lead to that form of riba. And that generate that form among the scholars, something called riba of the sunnah, which is riba of the biyu and riba of the qurud, where uh, riba of the, of the loan. Um, and those are, they call it riba of the sunnah or riba, they were prohibited uh, as a mean or called tahrim wasail, where the riba of the Quranic is tahrim maqasid. The reason I'm mentioning this so you know, like why the whole thing there is so much emphasis in uh, in 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 the dealings and in the transactions, and why the scholars they define so many of the transactions, including trade, ijara, lease, or uh, wakala, or, or 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 guarantees, to protect and define how these transactions avoid the prohibition of riba. So that really led to expansion and elaborate on these transactions to, vote, to avoid the, uh, the serious form of riba, riba the Quranic, which is really called riba duyun or riba. Sometimes in Arabic, they call it riba of zidni under. Give me more time, I'll increase in the, in the, uh, in the thaman, in the value of the debt. Excellent. So we have on your screen now some red flags to identify riba and haram in your investments. And as Bashar mentioned, it is a broad field in Islamic finance. Uh, it's not easy to do, um, as he also mentioned. And I would point out that we as Azad do work as behavioral coach for our clients, helping helping them to avoid riba and haram. And we do this through a, a very systematized process. And um, it's it's part of not not the only part, but a, a part of our, our larger halal investment process. So in addition to avoiding riba, there are other things that we'll talk about today to keep in mind when you're trying to make your investments halal. Uh, at Azad, as I mentioned, we put those things into a, a repeatable process for our clients. So let's talk a little bit about that and how we derive those rules. Uh, a lot of people ask us about how we make the rules for halal investing at Azad. The answer is that we don't. Very simply, we follow the rule makers, and those are the folks at AOFI. AOFI is the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions, which you see on your screen there. They represent input from eight schools of jurisprudence. They're really the gold standard for halal investing internationally. Uh, we pride ourselves on our strict adherence to AOFI at Azad. Again, we don't make the rules. We follow them. 
um, standards uh, 21 and 17 outline the process for halal investing at Azad and really for any other um, re respectable halal investing or Islamic financial institution. Um, there are other standards along the way. We encourage you to check those out at AOFI. Again, they are really the gold standard for Islamic finance. Within Azad as an organization, as a company, let's take a look at our Sharia compliance setup. It's really threefold. Uh, first, and of course, we have as our uh, basis of foundation those AOFI guidelines I mentioned before. First up, we, we do leverage AOV governance rules and have a built-in in-house Sharia governance uh, board or advisor as a first step to adjudicate those matters on a daily basis, things that come up that require HDHAD or or jurisprudence. Uh, we also have an engaged three-member advisory board and outside board, which provides guidance to the company. Uh, they meet regularly and provide rulings on an as-needed basis for those special cases. And then on top of that, kind of the third layer, we have an outside uh, auditing and advisory firm that uh, comes in to look at our processes and procedures when it comes to halal investing. Uh, also, when it comes to calculating zakat and purification, which we'll touch on in just a minute, to make sure that we are abiding by those AOV rules. And then I'll just talk a minute about the source of our information at Azad. Kind of, again, getting back to that halal investing process, it is a repeatable process. It's not really, it's nothing ad hoc. It's a, it's a, a, a systematized set of rules that we've incorporated over years. And so when it comes to investing, we have sources for financial information for various industry recognized databases like MSCI, Morningstar, London Stock Exchange Group, Icon, et cetera. We, we take that information that's kind of the universe of, in, of investable candidates. We'll talk about this in a moment. And then we screen it using a proprietary tool following those AOV guidelines that we just talked about. And again, we have that third-party verification come in to make sure that we're doing this according to AOV standards. It's really a, a process of continuous improvement, though. We regularly review and refine our, our uh, Sharia compliance and governance and we stay informed about emerging halal trends and best practices, updating that methodology fairly regularly. And talking a minute about our halal investment screens, following those AOP guidelines that we just mentioned really means a couple of things when it comes to investing in equities or halal stocks. First, it means filtering out those investments that are involved in prohibited lines of business. Uh, some of those are on your screen now on the left hand side. It also means um, looking at financial ratios. So we wouldn't invest in companies whose debt ratios are greater than 30%, for example. This is in, according, in accordance with AOFI guidelines following the Sunna of the Prophet. Uh, companies must also comply with other ratios regarding interest-bearing investments, debt, liquidity. Uh, this is in keeping, again, with that Islamic prohibition on riba that we talked about earlier, as well as the buying and selling of debt, which is problematic from an Islamic finance perspective. I've put a couple slides here on your screen just to show you how our uh, process works. This is just uh, really uh, hypothetical for the purposes of today's presentation, but to show you how things uh, typically work with our proprietary tool, it's called ISFA, which is the Investment and Screening and Filtering Application. We refer to it as ISFA for short around the office. We screen portfolios when they're first purchased and then ongoing every month uh, using that proprietary tool, ISFA. First, we obtain the universe of all stocks from those data providers I mentioned before. We run this universe through that software, which screens all the stocks in accordance with AOV guidelines. And this results in securities falling into one of four different categories, which you see on your screen there. The stocks passing our screens will have a pass ruling. Those that fail one or more of the screens that we talked about before will have a fail ruling and stocks that have any of their financial data missing will receive a not available stocks whose lines of business need to be further researched get a manual ruling indicating that additional research will be done sort of by hand so to speak um, when a stock does fall out of compliance we put it on a watch list and monitor it for a period of time if it still fails it's sold in accordance with the guidelines from our board when a new security is introduced into the model it's um, And it's not always a black and white case. We'll talk about some of those examples in a moment. We consult with our Sharia advisory board. They'll debate it. We present the company's financials. We're sometimes even bringing in our institutional portfolio managers themselves, and then ultimately come to a decision. Um, 
I'll give you a couple of examples in, in, uh, in a moment. But first, when I mentioned that it's not always a, a black and white case, I know that historically, Adizad, uh, Bashar, let me bring you in here just to talk about a couple of examples in the past where we've had these types of, of debates where it's not always clear cut whether or not a stock is uh, in compliance with the OFA guidelines. Um, we've, we've gotten this question before and we do have a few examples. I know, I don't know if there's one in particular you want to talk about. I know um, Visa was one that came up in the not too distant past. Do um, you have any maybe, maybe color or insight to offer into, into that as an example of the stock? You, you know, Josh, the, uh, the, the field uh, has a lot of gray area and uh, in order to operate uh, in, 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 in the capital market where there are so many companies with so many line of businesses, the quality of data available is essential to reach a good uh, ruling on any company. Uh, and I, I can see sometimes that, you know, like the, the process or the quality of data is still uh, primitive, you know, like they lack the depth of analysis, uh, the data and analytic companies still lack a well-defined and consistent process or metrics to identify and estimate the amount of haram revenue. Uh, data companies are rarely utilizing team of uh, professional financial analysts or, um, or even tools like AI uh, to research about these companies. So it's really very important to uh, uh, emphasize on the data about these companies because the ruling, as the scholar said, al al min that ruling on a on a, any matter is an extension of how you picture that matter, how you collect the data about it, and this is really a process that is dynamic. It's not one time. So you may, for example, companies they buy other companies, they do merger acquisition, they borrow money, they increase that. It's really a pro it's a dynamic process. It's not just one time. Oh, this company passes. I will take that company, I will keep it. You know, you need really to uh, examine these companies. And sometimes you, like even with the expertise that we have at Azad and we have like the processes and the tools and the data, we still run into a situation where we really need to consult one of the, with a, uh, uh, a Sharia scholar. That's why we go to our Sharia advisory board and we consult with them on these matters. And then, you need also, again, to review, like the way we do it at Azad, we review it on a monthly basis. And if we see a problem, you know, with the, with the one companies, we may divest from that company, liquidate, or and replace it with another company. And, and then uh, comes the process, what we call, for those, believe it or not, the purification. Some people, they have a myth that the purification is actually for the companies fail in your portfolio. Those companies should be completely out. Actually, we do purification for the companies that they pass the guidelines, correct? So right. we, we, we look at their uh, 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 prohibited line of businesses, and then we, we accrue it on a daily basis. Like we, we calculate this and we accrue it daily uh, so we can, at the end, uh, uh, get rid of that uh, haram income and, and you keep the one that you... Uh, that you intended to invest for. And I want to say something that the purification process is an integral part of the, um, of the fatwa upon which you can invest in companies of the capital market because what was presented to the scholars at AOFI and outside of AOFI, that the haram income or revenue is, not, is insignificant, is merely insignificant. And it's not really well intended, but you still have to cleanse it out. Otherwise, the scholars would not even tolerate investing in the capital market because, as you know, rib, the riba or any haram, uh, whether it's little or or a lot, it 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 ruins the whole uh, uh, the, the whole investment opportunity. In other words, you know, it it, it has to be consistent. So the the reason why we we can invest in the capital market because we believe that our intention is to benefit from the halal activities that these companies is doing. And the harm is merely insignificant and we can rid of it. That's perfect. Yeah. And we're going to get into purification in a little more detail in just a moment. But so we'll put a pin in that. But do you have some examples of areas where 
maybe there was some gray area about investing in a stock. Like I know Electronic Arts, Visa, McDonald's, those have all come up in the past that, yeah. that don't necessarily yield a clear cut result. It, yeah, it's good. It, McDonald's is a good example. You know, we we if you look at it, you know, the numbers shows that they don't they they tell you like, oh, the revenue that is coming from uh, selling of uh, um, pork, for example, is less than five percent. But actually, if you look, uh, uh, because why? Because they're showing, uh, like the way uh, McDonald's make business from, from from franchisees. You know, they charge a franchisee fee, and it doesn't show as a prohibited line of uh, of revenue, correct? But if you right. go to any McDonald's store, they tell you, like you know, they actually in the morning there is a lot of pork that is being sold and. Uh, it forms a significant amount of their revenue. So you really need to go dig deeper in this and then to realize that, you know, some of these revenues are hidden under different name. So, you know, you have to go and look deep into these companies, et cetera. So that's an example of uh, of McDonald's. Other example of, for example, company like, you know, a payment transaction companies like, you know, Visa. Although Visa as a credit card, uh, we know the Visa credit card, but actually the Visa company itself, it doesn't um, it doesn't charge, it doesn't get any revenue from interest. They just a payment company um, because we have they have a credit and they have uh, debit uh, ones. Actually, the banks that they're using the Visa, for example, are the one who is really advancing the uh, the debt from the credit and charging interest on that. So you really have to look deep into the uh, revenues and into the business activities and you need to really question these activities and then you um, so you can be able to come to a, um, a, a an accurate ruling about this these companies yeah perfect and i think that's a uh, a great segue into or maybe uh, another yeah. thing companies some companies for example they actually have a, a, a lending facility or a credit facility where they themselves, uh, you know, to finance their products, they have like almost like a, a mini bank. And so yep. you, they, they, they have a significant revenue coming from interest, you know. So, you know, all of these things like may not show in the main line of business. It may show in the, in the sub lines of businesses. So you really have to dig deep and you need to have, as I mentioned, this the process is really very difficult to be fully automated because I know some people now they rely on some applications and these applications they have really challenges in in getting the quality data or the the analysis where somebody can dig deep and question these numbers and and contact the uh, the uh, the companies uh, the investor relation departments or you know uh, contact some of these companies and I know some of these uh, companies they may not give you information because it's really private information is not available to the general public, but you can really ask a question that gives you an idea about how much of that, you know, haram uh, revenue is coming from these companies. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. We'll walk through some of our um, examples showing our screening process in action here. Uh, we'll start with one, uh, again, this is not representative of uh, any particular company in particular time, but I did pull this. This was uh, from quite a while back, back. I think, in fact, still passes, but this is a company that passes our screens. It's a technology company. Many of you know it. Uh, Apple Incorporated, it shows up as a pass after screening for lines of business and excessive debt or interest income through our proprietary filtering application in accordance with AOP guidelines. Um, the company could fall out of compliance, though, I think, to, to Bashar's point and uh, to the larger yeah. you know, discussion we're having today about how things need to be followed up on. And so we need to check back. And what we do at Azad is on a monthly basis, we check back to make sure nothing has changed in a company's line of business or in its financial statements. Um, as of late June, though, uh, as I mentioned, for this particular company, uh, Apple does pass our screens. Here's an example of a fail that I took from uh, quite a while back, just to show you what it would look like uh, with our screens. This is an example of IBM. Um, it it actually passes now. I should point out, um, as of uh, a few, uh, I, I, well, la earlier this month, I believe. Um, it's it's an example I took um, for today's webinar because it offers, I think, an interesting lesson. IBM uh, used to have 
excessive revenues derived from a financing arm, kind of like what Bashar was talking about earlier. And it resulted in a level of interest income that violated AOP rules. And so it flipped a flag in our investment screening and filtering application and it failed. Um, and again, as I said, I checked on this holding a few days ago and IBM actually passed uh, because the uh, revenues that were deemed impermissible uh, fell below our um, AOV inspired thresholds. So it, it's important because it demonstrates that stocks can fall into and out of compliance. That's why I included it today. And, and it's also important to, to screen regularly. And that's uh, kind of, I think, maybe one of the big issues that we're trying to hammer home today because you, you have to do this on a regular basis to know what you can own, what you are allowed to own. Um, also, when we talk to people on a regular basis, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty common to run across folks who think that by investing in, in information technology companies alone or by avoiding the obvious big offenders in the investing universe that they can do it themselves and keep their investments free of impermissible companies. Um, the point of this example is that looks can be deceiving. And it's important to have access to the data vendors that we were talking about before that report that detailed company uh, information that uh, offer us the statements and have the technology. On our end, it's important to have the technology to decipher what that means to a halal folks investor so you can you can keep that portfolio uh, in the halal. Again, halal investing in Azad is a, is a process, uh, which you see on your screen now. It's not a one and done event, but a repeatable, consistent series of steps that makes a portfolio halal. You'll see that also I include the cat and purification on our list of steps. We were just talking about that. Uh, it's probably a good opportunity and nice segue for us to delve into the subject a little bit deeper. Many of you know that we provide the cat statements. Um, if you're a client, you receive it annually. Uh, some of you uh, may have attended our annual cat webinars in the past, but many of you may not know that uh, there is a step in the halal investing process called purification, Bashar alluded to it earlier, and that's an important step in the halal investing process that you can't really skip. So we'll talk about that now. And it's essentially a, an aspect of halal investing that involves the donation of income earned from any unintended or unacceptable business activities by companies in which a shareholder is invested. As Bashar said, it really is essential that purification and the rules around purification be respected in order for an individual to stay within compliance of AOV rules and participate in the capital markets. Although, again, we follow those strict guidelines from AOV when it comes to investing for clients, we advise them that it's possible to unintentionally earn small amounts of income that's deemed prohibited. So interest income, Reba, for example. It's important that clients give away this income in order to purify their accounts. I often tell people to think of purification in their investments as kind of like carbon offsets for the for the for the climate so it's a way to to no, not benefit in any way from uh, uh unintended or um haram income and revenue so yeah, again just, it's yeah just the the iofi um uh stated that it's the responsibility of the inter inter uh, the financial intermediary to provide the muslim investor with the purification so i really urge like um, our audience to demand from the companies that they uh, provide them with a Sharia compliant investing to demand that they give them the purification calculations because it's really complicated to be calculated um, and to really um, uh, and invest in resources to make uh, that is available uh, to them. Right, perfect. And we just, uh, I am gonna get your questions at the end. We did have a, a question pop in that's relevant to what you just said, Bashar. Uh, someone asked, if it's purified at the Azad level, do do we still need to pay Zakat when we access the money? Do you want to address that very quickly? When, when, when we ourselves, we do not purify. We just give you the, cal the calculations, correct? We just pr give, provide you the, the numbers, how much amount you need to cleanse from all your accounts, and then... Uh, then you can really pay it from, uh, you can withdraw money from your account or you can pay it from other accounts. But right. uh, that's really separate. Purification, uh, the cleansing, I, I would say the purification as a cleansing and the zakat is completely two separate things. Yeah. Right, perfect. And those of us who get uh, the zakat statements see two different line items every exactly. year. There's the purification amount. We advise clients to give that away. And that amount is actually not even factored into this cat calculation, which comes next. So you net out purification 
and then calculates the cap on the halal assets that remain. You, you know, there is also, I found sometimes there is a myth among uh, clients that they think if I pay my zakat, then it's beautified. And because under the, I think there is some uh, terminology issue because or how people, they understand the zakat as a purification. But actually, the zakat is only on the halal money. It's not on the haram money. The zakat is not actually required on the uh, on the on the on the uh, on the cleansed money. It's not. This is not zakatable. Actually, we take it out from your zakat base when we assess the zakat. So yeah, there are two different numbers and two different concepts completely. Yeah, exactly. And that is uh, that is one myth. There are others that we can address right now. We've kind of taken a, a top five approach and decided to show you five frequently cited the frequently cited myths about halal investing, and we want to compare those to the reality. So, fact versus fiction here for a moment, uh, in keeping with the theme of today's discussion. So, myth number one: first up, there's a penalty to invest halal. Uh, there is this idea that halal investing means lower returns due to Sharia compliance constraints. Well, anybody who who paid attention to the top of today's presentation saw that uh, Azad's Sharia screened AOFI compliant strategies regularly win awards for performance, largely performance based strategies uh, yeah. that are up against their conventional counterparts. So clearly this is a myth, but uh, the reality just to fully explain the issue is that halal uh, screens don't necessarily lead to lower returns. And we've given you some examples on your screen. Uh, many halal investments, particularly in growing industries like tech and healthcare, have competitive returns and they're not inherently risky or riskier, I should say, either. By avoiding highly leveraged companies and speculative investments, uh, two things that you cannot do according to OFI guidelines, halal, halal portfolios can actually uh, sometimes be more stable and less volatile. So just to take a look at what's on the screen right now as a couple of examples we've taken the uh dow jones u.s total return which is uh, an index looking at all u.s equity securities with readily available prices compared it to the uh, islamic equivalent which is also u.s focused uh, that's the first two items you see on the screen and on the left hand side and then also the dow jones global total return which is a global total stock market index measuring more than 12,000 equity securities from 77 countries and compared it to the Islamic market world total return index, which is a comparable Sharia screen index of tracking equity securities from 70 or so countries that pass those rules based screens for compliance with Islamic guidelines. If you just take a couple of examples um, from history, uh, going back to Say, for example, the pandemic, the first few months of that very terrible time, markets sold off quite dramatically. And you actually see that uh, Islamic strategies uh, slightly outperformed their conventional strategies. Um, similarly, uh, th there have been other periods like that throughout history. I'll give you an example, uh, just to be fair, of a time when Islamic strategies underperformed. Uh, if we go all the way back to the turn of this of the millennium um, during the dot-com bubble burst, um, Islamic indices uh, slightly underperform their conventional counterparts, most likely owing to the fact that Islamic strategies often have a bias toward tech and healthcare. Um, tech, in this case, obviously sold off quite dramatically during that time for those of us who were around to experience it. So it's really a mixed bag, but there's there's no inherent penalty to investing halal, which I think is the larger point we're getting at here. We'll look, um, just in the interest of time, moving on, myth number two, uh, halal investing is the same as ESG or SRI investing. This is a, a common uh, fiction we often hear that halal investing is just ethical investing with a different name. Um, while in reality, there are similarities, halal investing is distinct. And hopefully you all have gathered that from what we talked about today. It's distinct in its adherence to specific Islamic principles like the prohibition of interest or riba and that excessive uncertainty or qadr. There is some overlap, of course, and that's why we've shown the Venn diagram here. Sometimes you're going to see halal strategies that have similar holdings uh, to those in the SRI or the ESG, environmental, social, and governance space. Uh, that does not mean that they are one and the same. 
Uh, in fact, because we have the specific criteria from, from AOFI and Islamic finance more broadly, there's going to be dramatic divergence in terms of the holdings of halal portfolios oftentimes when compared to their ESG counterparts. Uh, it's important to, to mention here that if you do work with a financial advisor who is not aware of AOFI or AOFI guidelines and does not implement them in a systematic way, that something called halal washing can occur. And halal washing is really the idea that an advisor or a product provider will simply say, oh, we've got it, you know, it's covered. They'll they'll claim halal compliance or Sharia compliance or even AOFI compliance sometimes. Um, but when you look under the hood, sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Uh, in fact, yeah. more often than not, if someone's a conventional advisor and they're offering you this, you you will be disappointed. Bashar, do you want to do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, like uh, again, uh, the socially responsible is a wide spectrum, and and it's um, it's not really as well defined as the Islamic one. The Islamic is very very specific, like financial ratios, uh, line of businesses, etc. So they actually no comparison. So some people they may say, "Oh, I just picked a socially responsible." That's really like you know what they call. Uh, I think you can do better by uh, focusing and demanding uh, halal Islamic one. They're not really close, to be honest with you. They're not. You know they they, they can do a lot of businesses that we uh, that deemed in in uh, in the Islamic faith to be uh, prohibited. Um, the, the other thing I just want to emphasize in, in really working with a, a financial advisor that is really a trustworthy when it comes to your values, principles, correct? And also knowledgeable, you know, with, or they have a source that they can tap into to guide them. Uh, because if they don't know, they're not going to really guide you. Like a blind pan. A blind man cannot guide a blind man. You know, you need somebody to really be aware of, you know, all these issues. And um, as you mentioned, IOFI, I consider IOFI is, is the golden rules because IOFI, they publish these standards, especially their Sharia standards. They have Sharia standards, they have accounting standards, they have auditing standards, and they have uh, like socially responsible even standards for that. And they publish. I think the Sharia standards now they're 62 and they're very detailed, correct? So if you can, I there are other organizations like IOFI, but IOFI is actually the one, the, the early ones started back in 1991, and it was actually formed by what we know the scholars of the Muslim Ummah around the globe, like not even the four madahib, even the eight madhabs. Some of them they're not really known that they come together. And they went through years of study and research and meetings and, and debate uh, in order to really uh, come up with these standards. These are really very thorough standards and their due process, they have a due process how to come with a standard. Some of the standards takes a few years before they release it to the industry. So I would work with somebody and now actually, IOFI now, uh, actually they, they published all these standards in nine languages, not even Arabic, English, Urdu, Turkish, Fr French, etc. And also they did something really brilliant um, about, uh, I would say, 15 years ago. They created a designation, a professional designation called Certified Sharia Auditor and Advisor, where as an advisor, you can go and study IOFI guidelines and you can learn and then sit down for a test to test you on all these concepts. And I really find that the people who uh, carry the designation, that they are really um, aware and they can really help you, uh, you know, guiding you in your investment. So if you can find somebody, if your advisor can be a certified Sharia auditor and advisor or, or the company that you're dealing with, they have on board a certified Sharia auditor and advisor, that would be great. And also... Uh, these companies, they have to have like, you know, uh, a structure. Even IOFI defined what is a structure of a Sharia compliant financial company with an investment bank or uh, insurance, the capital company. One of the things that they have to have an, a, a, an engaged Sharia advisory board, they have to have a guidelines and policies 
they have to have an internal review uh, personnel and they have to have an external review or external verification company. If, you know, I, I would say like, you know, before you do business with a company, if you want really to make sure that you're really being well served and you are really being um, uh, served for the fees that you're paying to this company, I would definitely ask and make sure that the company has all this structure and all the tools and the resources and expertise before you engage them and spend money thinking that, oh, I'm getting a Sharia compliant. Because remember, the issue, you have really to do your due diligence and to really uh, make sure. And, you know, it's not bad even to ask for what they call like now, IOFI, um, for a company to be in line with IOFI as a structure. They have to do a process where they could do a verification or a, um, a, a an audit. And that's really very important because we're a human being. We could make mistakes. We could think, so you need somebody to come and verify. And then what they do, this uh, external auditor, they report to the Sharia advisory board of the, of the company, and then they review it. And if there is an issues, they will be able to address uh, the management company. So this process is really very, very important to ensure that you're really getting the value that you hope to get from your uh, Sharia compliant uh, asset advisory company. Perfect. Thank you. And Bashar is too modest to mention him, but I will point out that he is a certified Sharia auditor and advisor. Again, we have another as our in-house compliance officer, and I will also refer you to those three layers of compliance, Sharia compliance that we have at Azad as a shameless plug for our firm. Moving right along, myth number three, nobody knows what's truly hot up. Uh, that's patently false. There's a, a transparent screening process and certification by Azad Sharia board for all of our investment strategies, making it easier for investors to verify compliance. We apply our halal screens to the universe of potential investments before our institutional portfolio managers even begin their investment process. We know exactly what is and is not within AOFI guidelines. And as we've mentioned already, we monitor those holdings on an ongoing basis, basis to maintain compliance. So the table on your screen here shows the percentages of companies in various asset classes passing our screens. This is as of June 14th, you'll see there on your screen. Using exchange-traded funds as proxies for the indexes, you'll see that the acceptable halal investable universe is sometimes less than half of all the stocks in an index. Uh, sometimes it's more, but the point is we know when and where to pick Sharia compliance stocks at Azad, and there's really um, very little truth at all to this myth, myth number three. Next up, myth number four, there are no halal investment options. Uh, there's no diversification. Um, so we're going to have to sacrifice. Uh, that's untrue. Uh, there are numerous halal investment options in the marketplace, including stocks, real estate, even Sukuk, halal fixed income, which we'll talk about in a moment. On your screen now is the equity style box, which represents major asset classes in the market. Uh, we can check the majority of those boxes uh, all on our own at Azad. Uh, just all by ourselves, because if you look at our lineup, we're really a one-stop shop of sorts from large, mid, small cap value and growth to even international real estate and that halal fixed income option I just mentioned. We've got we've got a lot. Uh, diversification, therefore, is achievable within uh, the halal investing space, Sharia compliant opportunities across various sectors and asset classes, allowing investors to build a diversified portfolio. Um, which is important for managing a portfolio's risk. Of course, the diversification can't predict the loss or gain. I want to bring something really interesting, uh, Josh. People, they see these companies that they act like as a sub-advisor and people, they ask and say like, you know, how, uh, like, you know, how do you know that these companies, they buy for you the companies that they are Sharia compliant, which is really a very, you know, a, a very good uh, question. Um, and that's what when I said, I said, like, you have really to make sure that you work with uh, somebody uh, that knows. But if that person doesn't know, as the scholars, they warn uh, to go into a business with somebody, of course, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, like uh, that uh, doesn't care about the Islamic, uh, the halal and haram in the in the financial dealings or uh, or not trustworthy. Um, you can you. It, there is exception to that, that you can deal with them, but you have to be in charge in the process. In other words, you have to really 
watch what's going on. You need to uh, hold them accountable. You need to have a policies and restrictions. And that's exactly what we do with Azad. This is a process we never delegated to anyone. We um, So we monitor all the portfolios that these managers buy. So before they buy or before uh, they do anything, we have to really approve. They have, we give them what we call a Sharia compliant uh, screened uh, sub universe from these benchmarks. And we restrict them to that one. So they cannot really go outside. For them to buy something, we consider that's an error. And that needs to be really addressed and corrected. So as you see the process that, yes, you can work with uh, advisors that the the um, if you choose to work with advisors that they're not Muslims or they're not aware of it, then you yourself has to take this responsibility and you have to be in charge to examine what they are buying for you. Otherwise, they're going to feed you the haram without knowing. Excellent point. Yeah, and that can we can fall into that halal washing that we that we referenced right. before. All right, myth number five: halal investing is just too complicated. Uh, the reality is, of course, that's that's not true because with the rise of specialized financial advisors like those of us at Azad, halal investing has become much more accessible. Uh, these resources simplify the process of finding and managing Sharia compliant investments, and it's true, of course. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, underplay this or downplay it, that the steps we've outlined today can be a lot if you're trying to do it all by yourself, if you're a DIY investor. But we've distilled these principles down into our seven tenets of halal investing, which you see on your screen there. And again, systematize them. I keep coming back to this word so that we have a full service solution to offer our clients. Yeah. Uh, the point here is that there are folks who can do it for you. Uh, we help you focus on matters that you can control and where we can make the greatest impact, things like tax management, charitable and halal estate planning and investment risk. We organize everything for you into a financial plan so that you can track and measure your progress every year. No matter what stage of your financial journey that you're on, we can help you get that financial clarity and peace of mind that your finances are halal. Bashar, anything to add to this one? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, if if you have been blessed with a lot of wealth and you want to grow such wealth in a halal, prudent way, then you need to utilize more of these wealth management services that the Josh listed uh, than the conventional investor, correct? You need really to a big why, because your choices are less, your more your accountability is higher. And I, I say spiritual ac accountability or faith accountability, and the process is more demanding, you know. So, uh, you, you know, then you need these services because, like, I think when the industry, the Islamic investing industry in the in the U.S. started, it was only limited to funds and portfolios. But now, you know, our uh, our market, our investors are growing more sophisticated. And they demand like, you know, more what we call sophisticated, smart way of maximizing their, for example, their benefit, their tax benefits. Um, so that's these services are really now available. And but I would say one more time, like, you know, if you're to work with a company, uh, like what I would say, share with them these values. Actually, you know, IOFI guidelines standard number 21 is there. But also, I want to say, like, sometimes we run into some people say, you know what, I uh, I work with an advisor from XYZ company. I don't want to name any companies. And, you know, they, they have, and you go to their website, they have nothing about halal, nothing about Sharia compliant. And I asked the person, like, have they gave you anything in writing that they will uh, provide you uh, and they will do the screening and the monitoring and the beautification and all these they say no. I said, how do you know that they are doing it for you? Because in our industry is heavily regulated. And I would say to, to save yourself, demand something in writing to be signed by the chief compliance officer of the firm. Because if they do this to you and they sign it, then in this case, uh, you preserve all your rights. And actually, you can hold them liable for violating or, or not giving you these services. So for yourself, at least, to make sure that you've done your homework and you, you did service and to yourself, ask that you get it in writing 
and to be um, on the company letterhead or on the com from the company email uh, and to be really signed by the by the chief by the compliance officer or the chief compliance officer. If you don't get that, I most likely you're not getting the halal. You've been deceived, as a matter of fact. But if you get it in writing, and God forbid something happened, one time we had uh, a client came to us from a big firm, and he was under the impression that they're giving him a Sharia compliant. When he presented to us, and we run it into our uh, tools to examine them, we found that there is awful violations. So we informed the client, and the client actually called the company and spoke to the Sharia compliance officer, and they they were very uh, concerned about what happened, and actually they reimbursed him. They returned all the fees that they charged him. I mean, he could ask even for more, but just to let you know, like you know, you gotta be very, very careful. Perfect. Yep. Great points. Uh, let me lastly put in a quick plug for shareholder advocacy, which we believe is an important part of being a conscientious Muslim investor. Shareholder advocacy means pressing companies to be better corporate citizens. It's one of our seven tenets of halal investing. Some of the recent work that we've done is on your screen now. The, the goal of shareholder advocacy or activism is to influence the actions and policies of companies. There are lots of ways for shareholders to communicate with corporations. Um, some of them include the, the basic one, which is voting proxies. Owning stocks gives you the right to vote on a company's proxy ballot, just as citizenship gives you the right to vote in elections. Anyone who owns stocks can vote proxies. Um, mutual funds and asset managers vote proxies on behalf of their investors. So if you're concerned about halal issues in your investing, it's a good idea to find out how your your uh, product provider or mutual fund company votes. You can find Azad's proxy voting guidelines on our website. Another level is to engage with management. This is through like sending letters, engaging in dialogues, things like that, to try to press them to be good corporate citizens. And then if it's unlikely that the company is going to engage in a dialogue, the situation may call for filing a shareholder resolution, which gets voted on at a company's annual meeting. And we're proud to have done that on several occasions, uh, as well as uh, the other the other two options as well. Ours is really an all of the above uh, type strategy. I'll also mention that enjoining good and forbidding evil are fundamental to our faith, and this extends to our finances. Uh, so we've used our leverage of stockholders on behalf of clients to push corporations to do their part to work for justice in the occupied Palestinian territories as well. Just another way that halal investing can give Muslim investors greater peace of mind. It's uh, an ongoing issue, and we'll continue to work on that. Uh, it's now time for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, please use the Q&A feature to ask away. Uh, we see questions coming through already. Uh, Bashar, I'm going to start with you and ask you about a question that came through regarding mutual insurance versus tecafl. Not really... Cloud investing per se, but there is an element of very, very, investing. very good, very good question. Well, mutual insurance, as practiced here in the U.S., has two problems. the uh, The first one is the pools of the mutual policyholders, like whole life, for example, cross trades risk with the uh, other pools, such as term life insurance. So it's actually not hundred percent mutual with the pools. So that the surplus, for example, of the term life pool is not returned to the uh, policyholders. This is actually the concept of the mutuality, where uh, if there is a surplus, surplus is not a profit, according to IOFI, how they define the takaful. So the surplus is actually belongs to the policyholder and the insurance company or the is really a service company charge fees for providing services uh, per cost, but not where the surplus is considered to be as a profit. So in this case, we looked at them and we tried actually to identify companies to see if we can uh, you know, uh, uh, sell their policies to our clients, but unfortunately they came short. We realized that the um, not all the pools are mutual. In other words, pools uh, trade risk with other pools and for example, term life, they don't they don't distribute any any dividends for that or return any of the profit as dividends. Uh, the second one is the underlying investment of the assets of the policyholders of the mutual pools are not halal. They invest in bonds, CDs, bank notes, bills, non-halal equities, etc. So actually, like even if they come, if they claim 
to be a mutual, correct? And this uh, pool of assets belong to the policyholder, then the policyholder should really have a, a, a halal ownership or, or an ownership of a halal uh, assets. So that these two uh, problems, uh, uh, you know, make us think that, you know, there is no a Sharia compliant, a mutual insurance company here uh, in the U.S. that can really pass the uh, the uh, the IOFI standard for uh, the CAFO. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we also got a question uh, prior to starting today's webinar and also during today's webinar about investing in portfolios that avoid investments aiding and abetting international crimes against humanity, um, occupation-free funds, genocide-free funds, those sorts of things. Uh, I, I would refer you to our investment strategies because we do add that in as a layer of compliance um, with our guidelines. I'll also mention that, you know, a lot of times if you're invested in conventional funds or uh, other types of funds, even those that sometimes complain, or sorry, <laughs> claim AOFI compliance, uh, you might complain because you can't really affect the lineup in that uh, mutual funds register or list of holdings. Um, it's kind of a what you see is what you get sort of thing. Um, with uh, our strategies, I showed the, the, the 12 on the screen earlier, uh, we offer mutual funds, but we also offer separately managed accounts, which are really custom tailored to the individual client. And so with a, with a separate account, um, or an SMA it's called, investors have the ability to exclude any stocks, um, including those of companies that they believe are involved in uh, human rights violations or those that you know benefit certain regimes that they might deem problematic. You have a level of customization, customization above and beyond that of mutual funds. So uh, it's important to, again, take a look at, at uh, what's under the hood, see what you own. And then if you have problems, you know, let those folks know and, and take a look at our offerings as well. You might like what you see. Bashar, I have another question here about uh, life insurance. Yeah. Uh, if you want to take that one well, just broadly. Li yeah, life insurance, again, I mean, life insurance is problematic, you know, too, here in the U.S. I haven't seen any life insurance that is uh, really s uh, structured as a uh, takaful, correct? Because, and be careful, life insurance actually, because we're trading money for money. So there could be involved what they call riba of the beer. Because if you read the insurance policy, it says like we sell you this policy. So they sell you the, the risk. Where the takaful one, the relation between the policyholders are a mutuality as cooperative, as a gratuitous uh, transaction. Like, you know, I will pledge to help you, you pledge to help me. And if there is any surplus from after you pay all the claims, that belongs to the um, to the policyholder. So it's not really as a profit. So this is really how the uh, the mutual, the the takaful concept insurance is very critical, very essential, um, and it's it's a very good uh, social uh, tool that people, they can really cooperate with each other. That's why, you know, the, the Islamic concept of the takaful is a cooperative. It's a, the relationship between the policy are a gratuitous relationship. And there are so many models of that. IOFI, they, they have so many models. And believe it or not, I realized that some of the big insurance companies here in the U.S. or the global ones, when they operate, for example, in a Muslim country like Malaysia, Indonesia, they actually serve them with a takaful one that is 100% Sharia compliant. So it's really, the alternative is there, it's viable, but unfortunately, it's not available here in the US. Somebody says, oh, Bashar, you know, you're, uh, you're making it haram for us to use insurance. I'm not saying that. I'm just giving you what is the Islamic guidelines. And I'm, I'm not giving you, I'm not giving you a fatwa. I'm not your imam. You need to consult with your imam uh, if you want a fatwa from this but i'm just telling you what is really consistent with the sharia guidelines and what's what's not consistent and i understand sometimes you are in a certain circumstances where you have to compromise or you under under uh, circumstances of general needs or necessities i'm not really discussing that at all but i'm just telling you what is really if we're if somebody to come and create what a sharia compliant uh, life takaful company or or auto takaful company or any of that, then the model will be um, a, a, a cooperative model, not 
a stock model or a um, what do you call it a commercial model where the risk is being traded and etc. Perfect. I see a question that came through regarding the example I gave earlier of Apple computer um, and it passing. Uh, the looks like the participant took a look at the 10K um, uh, company's annual financial statements and they identified a certain amount of revenue from interest. And I apologize if I misled you to believe that Apple doesn't have any interest revenue. Oh, or income. In of fact, course. sometimes they do. Uh, in fact, most companies are going to have an accounts receivable okay. <laughs> line item or something, and interest is going to come into play. The key is that it is below that that 5% uh, threshold that AOFI established, and that it is a small, like a de minimis amount, so to speak, of revenue. And that's where purification comes into play. So this is money that we would calculate for you on a per share basis and accrue it and report it out to you. To give away so that you do not unintentionally benefit from that haram income because yeah. you don't want to do that as a halal investor so just wanted to clarify as, that as a matter of fact josh even the scholars they distinguish between operating interest and non-operating interest like the operating interest where the with where the institution or the business is actually in the business of lending money correct so it's like a bank where the non-operating interest is the company has in cash and they put it in a bank account that earn interest the scholars distinguish between the two. But again, that should come out through the purification, through the cleansing, correct? So right. that's, and again, the whole concept, I, I would say it over and over, the whole concept of investing in the capital market, that your intention is to benefit from the halal assets and business activities. There is haram there, we know there is haram there, but this is not intended. And if, if, if your intention changes, even for half a percent to benefit from the haram one, the whole thing is nullified. The whole thing would not become a acceptable. So that's really, you have to really understand this and the fact that we can really calculate and cleanse that money and get rid of it. So yes, most, I think probably like, I would say 99% of the companies, they will have an interest income, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. It really does come down to intention and, and actions are according to their intentions. Let me ask you a question, Bashar, as a, as a follow-up that came through a little earlier today about purification since we're on that subject. The question is, is the purification amount calculated yearly on the total balance amount? How about if I paid last year, do I deduct the purification amount from last year's amount? Yeah, I mean, if you paid, if you paid the purification, that's it. Then that, you already paid it, correct? So, so in this case, the whole inv your investment now is cleansed from any um, uh, cleansed money from any haram uh, income or har haram assets, correct? So that's it. Then, then you move forward. Right, moving forward. So, um, on an annual basis, though, like for example, when we issue this yeah. cap statement, we're we're calculating just, that amount as yeah. well. Maybe just like with when you pay the zakah, maybe the same time. You know, you uh, you you do the two, but also be careful. The 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 distribution channels of the cleansing money is different than the zakah money. So the 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 cleansing, just make sure you don't you don't use it to build the masjid or to bring the Quran, because that has to be from the purest of your money. Correct. So some people they may say, okay, I'll donate to my masjid. No, nope, not the cleansing. You can you can uh, you can donate charity because we don't even consider this to be a Honestly, we don't even consider it to be as a charity. It's a, it's a money washed out, never intended. I have nothing to do with it. That's how it is. Right. Uh, moving along, I've gotten this question a couple times now um, regarding fixed income and whether or not it's haram. Um, I, I don't know if you want to address. I mean, obviously, we have a halal. Yeah, fixed that's a very good question. I, I really fun. like this question. Well, what is the definition of fixed income? Fixed income refers to an investment that pays out a set of level of reasonably expected cash flow to investors. Examples of fixed income. Like there's so many, there's so many fixed income trans Sharia compliant transaction in our life. Well, the rental income is a fixed income. The murabaha sale, where the payments, where the profit is embedded, that's also a fixed income. Wakala deposits in Islamic banks, they are fixed income. Sikuks are fixed incomes. 
So the problem is not really the, fi the, the term fixed income. We need to look at the transaction and we need to see, is there any lending in interest? Is there any um, where the, the debt will, will grow for delinquency, you know, for the mere passage of time? Uh, is there is this is really a trade of cash versus cash without uh, uh, without really having any tangible assets? So the the the, the term just fixed income can include uh, a Sharia compliant transactions. As a matter of fact, it's really sinful to do a rental income without determining the price. So it has to be a fixed price, and that's a fixed income. You cannot make it, for example, variable. There would be a lot of what you call jahala or speculation in the transaction. So you again, it's really matter what's really the underlining uh, investment. But you know, in conventional, when you see fixed income, I would be more actually, I would be more cautious when I see that term. You know, because most likely in conventional world, they're going to be really done out of like you know money market funds or treasury bills or government securities or or bank notes etc right kind of a new type of assets um can you talk uh briefly about 529 college savings plans we often get those questions about Actually, uh, saving for education yeah. for children yeah you know 529 college saving plans they are actually they are a great tax saving plans but unfortunately they don't offer a halal underlining investments uh, Muslims in the U.S. need to uh, push for persuading at least one of the sponsors of the 54 educational saving plans in the country to allow investing in a halal fund. I think that would really remove uh, the, the problem. I mean, I, I myself spoke to so many um, Muslim uh, pol uh, politicians um, on the state level to see if they can persuade these states to allow at least to push the sponsoring companies because they're actually mono, uh, dominated by a few companies for every state uh, and, you know, using political lobbying to allow at least uh, one of these halal and mutual funds to be in those uh, 529. I think this, this is uh, something that we as a community have really to strive for and work better to uh, push for uh, sponsors to allow or to add a halal fund. I think the first state will do this will uh, will uh, attract tremendous amount of assets because this is really a challenge because 529 provide wonderful uh, tax benefits for saving for your children education. Uh, the money will grow tax-free if it's used for uh, education. The money that you contribute is actually after tax money. And if you are contributing to the state that you are in, they can allow you uh, deductions on your state taxes. So it's wonderful, but unfortunately, it's not available and we, we cannot recommend it to our clients. If they want to do it, they can do it on their own, but Azad will not be able to really hold these assets or direct the clients or advise the clients on 529. There is an alternative for that, you know, the cover deal, the cover deal, they allow $2,000 per child uh, per year uh, with some restrictions and the money will grow tax uh, tax-free, the same thing if it's used for uh, education and doesn't have to be actually colleges. You can even use it for uh, schools. Um, and also the other alternatives for college education, maybe you can use uh, AGMA account or ATMA accounts, which is general saving for your children. It doesn't give that much tax benefits, very little ones, but, you know, 529. I hope one day uh, we, we, we can persuade one of these uh, 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 50 states, 52 states, to allow um, a, a, a 529 or one of these 54 plans to allow a, 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 a Sharia compliant or a halal fund. Perfect. I do have a question. It seems like it pops up every time we do a webinar. Cryptocurrency. How is it dealt with? Do you have thoughts on it? It is obviously a... Uh, a subject that's very popular these days doesn't seem to go away. It's an evolving field. You know, scholars are still split. And again, it's all about what is they define as money as a storage of value. You know, many of them, they want to see a sponsor, um, somebody sponsor. And again, that's not how 
a cryptocurrency is uh, its design. So uh, again, you'll find the scholars, they think that there's a lot of, lot of, a lot of ambiguity in this and others, they tell you, no, this is really like any other tool. Um, it is like a device. It's like you're owning uh, uh, Western Union or one of these like, you know, devices where you can transfer money back and forth, but still the field is evolving. Um, and I, and honestly, I, I, I do not recommend it for clients, you know, it's very speculative. I know there's a, people made a, tons of money on that one, but uh, I, I think the IOFI, even IOFI, they don't have a, a stand on this issue, you know. Perfect. Good answer. Just a couple more here. We did have a question uh, earlier come through on annuities. Uh, I know it's a big subject. Very good question. Also, annuities. Annuities, it depends whether they are fixed or variable. And whether they are in accumulation stage or in annuitization stage. Also, whether the underlying investments are halal or non-halal. So, but the fixed annuity uh, the usually uh, government securities, bonds, etc. The fixed one, correct? But if you can, if you can do a variable, and they allow you in that variable to use a halal fund, um, then that will work. If the if you find an insurance company that uh, allow you to do a variable uh, annuity and use a halal fund, Sharia compliant fund, there is nothing wrong with that as long as you don't annuitize, because annuitization is actually like exchanging money for money, and that's really problematic. It will lead to what we call riba of the BUR. There's a, some kind of riba in it, or, uh, or uh, again, it leads to uh, a lot of uh, speculation, or uh, gambling in that sense, or maser, correct? So, yeah. so that's really the, uh, the, about the annuities. Perfect. And I know we alluded to it earlier in the presentation, but just to kind of circle back to the concept or the phenomenon of screening apps for the do-it-yourself investor, um, any any other comments on that? I do I do have a question. Well, I just you need this. to understand that there are limitations and actually they themselves, actually I contacted many of them and they all acknowledge that there are limitations and there is no uh, consistent repeatable process of uh, researching these companies. So you will find sometimes they give you like, they, they don't know much because it's all about the public information. And I, and I, I myself actually had a criticism on the, uh, on the data that they're being used. Uh, it's really started from 1998 when the Dow Jones Islamic Market Index launched their uh, benchmark for the first time. And they actually relied on companies at that time, Thomson Financial, to bring to provide the information. But there is like no, I would say, like a a an attempt to really scrutinize and research and dig deeper in these companies, and or to to use like what we call a a, a reasonable uh, estimation for the revenues. Uh, like at Azad, we we decided to go outside of this and engage a company that uh, customized for us the research itself. In other words, they will go dig deep and they will try to estimate how much of the haram revenue beyond the ones available, for example, through uh, the uh, the SEC websites and etc. Correct by by. And sometimes they utilize what they call artificial intelligence. But the main thing that they use a, a financial analyst, professional people who can uh, sit down and go and examine these companies. And that really is costly, unfortunately. Uh, it, it costs multiples of multiples what you get from these uh, 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 applications there. So you have to take them with a grand, a grand soul. Um, the, they're they're a good starting point, but uh, you cannot really rely on it all the time, and you you be ready to find uh, mistakes and errors. Thank you. So some words of caution there for the 
DIY investor. On that note, let's talk about what we learned today. We're going to put up on your screen now some tips to protect your income and your assets from haram. We're going to conclude again with some practical ideas to, to help you uh, stay on the right side of this issue. As you see at the top of the screen, ask questions. If you have uh, an advisor currently, uh, we, we think that we've given you some, some ammunition today to, to go and, and really get into the nitty gritty to figure out uh, what it is that you're investing in and whether or not they are truly abiding by AOP guidelines. Uh, and if not, if halal washing is occurring, um, don't don't get pushed into something you don't understand. Um, and, you know, if you, if you don't know, ask, uh, understand the transactions, look for tested strategies. Um, and then just a piece of general investing advice, you know, don't go for the, you know, the most you know, flashy returns or investment trends. We've talked a little bit about that today as well. Um, and then just general advice as well, understanding kind of your risk tolerance and, and that sort of thing. Also very important to make sure that you're in an appropriate investment. Also remember, not on your screen, but I'll just throw it out here. Make sure you purify, not just, you know, pay your zakat. I think that's a theme that we've, we've addressed today and, and, and can't emphasize that enough. Also, uh, if you are currently invested uh, through a, an employer provided retirement uh, program or plan, Ask your benefits administrator or your HR department for halal options if you don't have them currently. Sometimes there's there's some wiggle room. They can work with you. And uh, if not, sometimes depending on the the uh, retirement plan platform uh, or the 401k provider, you can get uh, a self-directed op uh, option some, sometimes through a brokerage window or something along those lines. So again, look for halal funds in your company retirement plans. Don't just settle for what you got. Uh, and if, if you don't like what you got, make some noise about it. Yeah, uh, we also want to take this opportunity. Oh, anything to add there, Bashar? Yeah, I just want to say, like, just be vocal with it, you know. And uh, you know, you have what they call a brokerage link, for example. They allow you self-directed or PCRA. And if that still doesn't work, then I would say think to find another employer who can give you really uh, a halal choice in your investment, because I think you'll be surprised that retirement will be a big chunk of your saving and. You know, just take it seriously. You want to really uh, do something that you feel comfortable with that because, you know, you, you deserve it. You deserve to have a, a, a retirement plan for ONK that really grow according to your value and faith and principles. And you don't have really to feel that you're compromising. Wise words and sage advice there from Bashar. Thank you. Uh, we also want to take this opportunity to inform you about our upcoming webinar schedule. Uh, our next webinar will be our annual mid-year check-in with Fiducian Advisors. That's our outsourced chief investment officer. That's going to be on July 25th. Please be on the lookout for more information soon. And that's going to conclude today's presentation. I'd like to thank our special guest, Bashar Qasim, for being here. Your, your words of wisdom, your advice, and your counsel is incredibly appreciated. And uh, also a special thank you to all of us, uh, all of you who took the time to be here with us live today and for sticking around for the full 90 minutes. If we didn't get to your question, or if you'd like to get more information about something, please reach out to us. Our email address is hello at azadasset.com. Also be sure to follow us on YouTube using the handle at Azad Funds, and you can find us on LinkedIn under our full name, Azad Asset Management. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you very much, Bashar, for being here. It's much appreciated. Cool. Thank you.